You didn't pick him in 2014, did you? <laughs> You're going to bring that up? <clears throat> yeah, I think we should. <laughs> Let's get to the bottom of this. I think we should. This should be the... F- I'm the blaming dis- Sam. He was my vice captain. Right. So we've got the captain and the vice captain not picking the current captain uh, in 2014. I think excuse we should me, finally get won, to the bottom me, of this. Who won in 2014? <laughs> Do we have any boxing gloves under the, uh, under the table? I think he did the right job. Eh? <laughs> Thank you all very much for joining us for our Ryder Cup captain special. Obviously, the podcast is high performance. So I want to start by asking each of you in turn, what is high performance in the context of the Ryder Cup? <sighs> you want me to start? Um, I so. Yeah, I mean, high performance is the ability to consistently overperform, I think, time and time again. You know, and I think we've certainly done that as a team in Europe. You know, I don't think on paper, often we are the underdogs. We are, we're always the underdogs. Um, you know, the Americans are always very strong there. On paper, their world rankings uh, way, uh, way better than ours consistently. Um, but we find a way to win. And, um, you know, I think that is what high performance is really, is, is, is you know, finding a, a way to win even, um, you know, when, when you're not expected to. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> I think it's about staying in the moment as well. Never get ahead of yourself. Just concentrate on your match. It's very difficult out there to look ahead and see what everyone else is doing because there's nothing you can do apart from win your own point. Or you and your partner are singles, it's your point. And just stay there and just dig in and whatever he does, do something better Mm. and just keep going to the end. No matter what, you come off that last green and you've not left one ounce of anything behind you. Very nice, Sam. What about you, Paul? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think the words high performance are what it's all about. I mean, everything that captains do behind the scenes is about creating high performance. And, you know, the job of captains is not like it is in rugby and soccer, where you're on the touchline and you're making in-play decisions. It's rare that a captain in a Ryder Cup, very rare. I mean, you didn't do it, Sam, did you? Get involved in giving advice on the course. I don't remember many captains I played under did it, it was, it, it was it, a couple of instances where I should have done, and one I did, and Bernard Langer told me to do it. And the other one was Fulke and uh, Philip Price playing in foursomes at the Belfry. And on 17, they'd driven it in the bunker. And Philip was in there with three wood or five wood to hit it over the ditch, which would have made it a wedge in instead of a seven iron in. But he's, if he hits nine iron out there, he's got seven iron in. And there were one down. And I really wanted to go in and stop him. I say, you're making a mistake here because you've got to hit an absolutely perfect shot with a wood out of bunker. You'll get that right seven times out of ten, and it's probably going to be the one, the three, that's, that's going to hurt us most. And I didn't say anything. But uh, the other one was, I think, with Darren. It might have been you on the fairway, and Bernard said to me, do you, Sam, do, oh, yeah, do, you, think he's be- do you think he's better yeah. if Paul plays first? That's right, yeah. And take yeah. the pressure off Darren. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So I come over and ask yeah. you to go first, and you had a great shot, and then, yeah. Yeah. and that was it. There's See, a little time. There's little things. There's times where you feel, is it right? Is it should you just step in there and say something? And I think in hindsight, yes, one hundred percent. I think all these guys are high performing athletes, aren't they? And they know how to do it individually. And so you got to kind of keep that that mindset as well. You got to. Yeah. You, you, they know how to perform at a high level. Um, you're just there to kind of observe and then obviously give them information. And if that's how they want to take that information and, and use it. Um, so it's not just about telling them how to play because they all no, know how to do that, that, that you know. And uh, But no, there are no. instances where, you know, you've seen something in a previous match or a match in front of them and you think, well, maybe that, that will help them, you know, give them a little bit of information. They can take it or leave it. But... You know, I think once Friday comes the morning, you know, you're sort of just letting them go. Let them go. You know, you're trying to create that culture uh, and get them in the right frame of mind before Friday morning. But, uh, you know, after that, it's sort of let them go go play. At the end of the day, you sort of adjust, I suppose. I mean, I haven't gone through it yet, but I've, I've been through it as a vice captain. But as a captain, you know, I think you want to just observe a lot and then you obviously make... Uh, adaptations uh, along the way um, just just depending on how the players are looking how they're feeling how how they're reacting under that pressure uh, all that kind of stuff that that's how I saw it too I, I didn't get involved like Sam got involved two instances there I didn't get involved at all I'd never give advice I didn't see my role as telling Rory McIlroy it's a six rather than a five 
Um, I left it up to him and empowered him and the caddies. And I said that at the start of the week, I'm not going to get involved at any stage in any decision making on the golf course. You're the best players in the world. You've made great decisions to be where you are. And my job is to observe, watch, and as Luke says, get, you know, get prepared for the next roll of the dice and who's going to be playing in the afternoon or who's going to be playing the following morning. Um, so there's different ways of doing it. I know Seve was really involved, wasn't he? Uh, <laughs> Seve him. really got involved in playing. He wanted to hit every shot. He wanted to hit, yeah. I was telling, him, telling Monty, was but, it, was it Darren, the 17th? No, and Darren, and Darren, was Darren was on 17. <laughs> and he had to tell him to uh, politely go away. Yeah. Leave me alone. Oh, no. I, it's yeah. not sand wedge. You're missing a wedge. Pity <laughs> wedge. Yeah, yeah. We've, a we've little wedge. Played. You hit it like this. I think we've all played and played under very different captains. You know, everyone has different personalities. I had Bernard Langer was my first captain in 2004. Super detail orientated. You know, I just felt like I knew exactly my role, where I needed to be, what uh, what was expected of me, my partnerships. I kind of knew in advance. You know, nothing really surprised me, which was good for me. I kind of liked that structure. So I really enjoyed uh, playing under Bernard. But, you know, the next two years later, I was with Woozy, you know, completely different character, sort of a little bit more, less structured. Let's go in the bar, have a glass of wine and talk things through, you know, that kind of feel. Um, you know, and it was just very different. We won both of them 18 and a half to nine and a half. So, you know, sometimes it just comes down to, you can get the players in a great spot, but sometimes it comes down to, you know, the talent and how they perform uh, on those days. And the wine stuck with you. Well, we're <laughs> high-performance athletes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the fact you three are on the red wine yeah. and we've got the water. <laughs> so what would you say are the best attributes of the captains that you played under then? Again, for me, it was communication, uh, kind of having that clarity, that that uh, understanding what the plan was um, ahead of time. Um, you know, I think most people... Uh, especially the 12 that we have now, I think they appreciate that. Uh, they they want to kind of have a, a sense of what's going to happen, a sense of who they might be playing with, um, just to, so they can prepare. I think um, that's important for me, you know, is this is that, that constant clarity, that constant communication. I'm interested in how all three of you kind of approached it. You know, as we sit here now, you've both done the job. You're very close to doing it. So did you have a really... F- did you have a really fixed idea of the kind of captain you both would be? And, and are you sitting in now with a very clear idea of the captain you will be? Or is it about getting everyone together and feeling it? Well, I wanted just to look after them individually. Right. And make them feel special. How did you do that? Talk to them. Take them aside. Just be a pal, really. To me, the captain yeah. was always daunting. It's kind of like the headmaster in the school. That's why the vice captains are great. Mm-hmm. You know, so you can go to the vice captain and say, I've got the wee problem here, can you get it fixed? He'll either fix it or take it to the captain, and he will definitely fix it. But the captain was kind of up there, you know, so it's different for me to be that man up there. I was normally the reprobate causing them trouble. Hmm. But just make sure that we're feeling okay and relaxed. And Yeah, I think it's like caring you know just the care show them that you care that that, that uh, you know that they're important and you're you're doing all the work to give the, them the, the best team to to succeed and um yeah i don't think you can really change who you are i mean i've had to maybe become a little bit more outgoing extroverted you know uh, up my communication i'm i was someone that kind of stuck in my own lane as as a player individually I think a lot of us do, you know, we're, we're sort of, isn't it very individual sport? You don't, you don't kind of, you mix a little bit with players, but you know, you're very single minded about what you need to do to be successful. Ryder Cups are a little bit different. You, you want to keep that mindset with the players, but you know, you want to create that belonging that, that everyone is there and that you care about them. And uh, so I think, uh, you know, for me, that, that was a big, that's been a big thing for, for me and my captaincy. Can you give us any tangible examples of how you demonstrate that you care for one of your team? <laughs> um, I guess it's just constant communication, constant feedback, um, you know, wanting to hear from them as well. You know, not just thinking that I know everything, just getting their opinions, getting their takes. Um, you know, I think that's that's important. Uh, there's, there's certain things I, w- I won't go into because they're, I think they're sacred to the team of how to, to create that belonging, that uh, 
getting guys feeling comfortable around each other. Um, certain things that that we've we've done um, as a team. You know, I mean, there's, some of these aren't secret. You go, you know, you create dinners, you go out to dinners, and you know, you just get to know them. Um, even my wife Diane plays an important role. You know, I think talking to the wives, making fit them feel uncomfort- comfortable, the partners, um, girlfriends, all those. You know, so you know, once we get there on the match week, um, you know, we we already understand each other a little bit more. We already. Um, happy in a team room together. We're not feeling like, you know, the rookies are in one table and the superstars are on another. No, everyone's mixing together and and uh, involved uh, with each other. So that's kind of my philosophy anyway. I think there was, a, there was, you know, on that, you know, winning a team, you know, you're going to have some stars who are guys who are the superstars and are going to be the guys, you know, taking the heavy load in terms of playing big matches and a lot of matches and then other guys that are going to come in and, play a lesser role in terms of lesser matches. Um, and so there is that natural divide in every team. Um, and I was part of the vice captaincy in, in 2012 in Medina. And one of the things that came out of Medina that became very clear, um, Oli was the captain who was very instinctive. So he made his decisions based on his heart and his soul more than analytics or anything else. Now, there's not many people who's as big a heart and a soul as him. And, you know, we were all waiting. And sometimes he was waiting till five minutes. You know, the guys were in play in the morning and he wouldn't put the team for the afternoon in until literally he wouldn't make his call well, until five saved. minutes before. So that was causing chaos yeah. for the guys. As Luke says, a lot of them are like him, kind of OCD style structured and like to know what they're doing. And you got four guys back in the locker room climbing the walls, not knowing whether they're teeing off in an hour or not. And Ollie was, you know, and at the eleventh hour he'd make his call. So one of the th- one of the things in the debrief that we found from um, from Medina was the value of maybe instead of having four vice captains, one to follow each game and the captain to roam, that we needed a fifth vice captain right. to be with the four guys who were not there. So there was a constant stream of communication back rather than somebody having to come off the golf course to go in and say, wait a minute, guys, he still hasn't made his decision. I'll be back in half an hour and then back out to follow their game again, which is what Thomas Bjorn had to do. Um, uh, so, you know, that's the kind of thing that evolves. And, you, you know, you got to be careful because communication is so important and you don't want the guys who are not playing to feel second rate. Um, and that's where the value of a communication comes in. And there's always a way of communicating to feel if you're not playing the next day, but, you know, making them feel good about not playing the next day. You know, there's a way of, as Alex Ferguson said to me, you know, never give bad news on its own. Always give good news with it. You're not playing in the morning, but I did that with Graham McDowell. You're only playing three matches, but I'm going to put you out number one in the singles on Sunday. So, you know, there's a yin and a yang there. And so, you know, that's what good communication is about. It was a two-team dinner and the officials. And I just got back, finished press conference, back to the room about quarter to six. And my wife uh, had run me a bath and left a glass of champagne on the side of the bath. And she was away getting her hair done. So I'm just, oh, this is perfect. So I just get into the bath and the phone rings. Unfortunately, very nice handily, there was a phone beside the bath. So I picked it up, hello. And it was Pierre Fulke. He says, Sam, Sam, I, I have a problem. I said, well, what is it, Price? He says, no, I, I can't tell you on the phone. I need to see you. I said, okay, well, you know where my room is. Just come. I hadn't got one leg out the bath and there's a knock on the door. Jesus Christ. So I got up, put a towel on, I go to the door and I open the door and he looked quite ashen. He, and I thought, there is something wrong here. But what is it, Pierre? And he brings from behind his back his tie. And he goes, I can't do the knot. I don't want to, I wanted to kill him. But this was, this was what I wanted. This is a rookie winding up the captain. Yeah. This is what the, the camaraderie coming out. It was magnificent. You see, this is interesting though, isn't it? And, uh, you know, you're a golfer, right? Suddenly you're going to have to employ a load of skills that the guys have just explained about understanding human beings, communicating, solving problems, stuff that you haven't had to do for your career. So I wonder where kind of fear and doubt and imposter syndrome is sitting for you at the moment, having to do something that you've not done in a in a long and distinguished career? I mean, I think there's fear in everything that you do in in life that's tough, you know, but that's, I think, you know, it's just part part of it. You know, I'll be nervous. I was, you know, in practice trip, you know, when I talk to the guys, it's not my natural um, place, but, you know, if I'm prepared, then I can can do it and I can 
uh, um, send the right message. And, you know, I think once you step towards that fear and you go through it, you like, you come think about, about it 10 minutes later and you're like, ah, oh, it wasn't, wasn't so bad, you know, it's, it's fine. So, um, yeah, I think there's fear in everything that you do, but, uh, you know, I've, I've tried to step back a little bit too and enjoy the journey as much as possible because, you know, again, a lot of the past captains have told me that, you know, it goes quite quickly. It's, it's high pressure. Monday it's, to Thursday is just extraordinary. Yeah. It's gone like that. Yeah. And there's a lot going on and it's a very busy week, the Ryder Cup, you know, as a player even, you know, it's a long week. There's a lot going on. There's dinners, there's gala dinners, there's opening ceremonies there's uh, all kinds of like videos and you know fun things for the team and there's a lot you know i've certainly the last couple of weeks you know i feel like i wake up an hour or two before i should be waking up because my brain is you know all, got all these thoughts and all these things that i'm trying to figure out and plan and you know i have i write notes down a lot i've I always have a notebook I, I write things down i put things in my phone and you know, I think that's just the the way I am. Not, not every every captain would be like that, but uh, you know, I like to listen and and learn from from the people that that came before me. Well, that's great, Luke. That's exactly what your job is, and a lot of it is just listening to your players, to your team, what they're saying, what they're doing, how's he feeling. Skill it, sets it's so the, instinctive. You, you you'll fly through it. It'll, the skill sets of the vice captains is important too. You know, where you're weak, you put somebody in strong. Um, I mean, I had Sam as a vice captain um, because, you know, he's got this effusive energy that, you know, was going to radiate through the room. And it was really important that, you know, to have that, I wanted a vibe, you know, so I made sure that I had vice captains who were going to have a vibe about them. Um, that's, you know, that's that's really mm -hmm. important. So, you know, there are, I'm, you know, Luke was saying there about him being structured. I'm the opposite. I'm really unstructured. So I had to force myself to write things and take a notebook, as he says, and write things down on my phone. And he used to drive me nuts because, you know, I, I'm better when I'm unstructured. So I had people luckily around me who were structured. You know, Scott Crockett sitting over there, very structured. Um, you know, um, my PA, Emma, the he same. the wine well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you learn that. You know, you learn that. And it makes you grow as a person. You know, it certainly certainly made me do. I'm sure you'd feel the 100%, same, Sam. You know, you do. You'll come it's out the other side of this as a, you know, a more rounded person. It's such an honor to be a Ryder Cup captain. Yeah, yeah I was pretty when pretty anxious when I first got the call to be it. You know, obviously, you did know, you, did like, you could, can I do this? Were you expecting the call? Or? Well, I obviously applied to, to try and be the captain. So it was, it was a nice surprise, uh, you know, when it happened. But... Yeah, you, you always question yourself, can I do this? You know, I'm 45, um, you know, am I ready? Uh, is this, you know, what does it entail? But you just take every day as it comes and you just keep moving forward. And I think, you know, I've certainly learned a lot over the last 13, 14 months that I've been in this position. So like it's what? been learning that I can do it, I think. Uh, learning that, you know, my players, um, you know, I, I, behind me and I think and, and I'm and I'm behind them so you know I think that's that's really the most important thing it's an what's exalted the, position to look up to you look what's at you the application pride. process for like to apply for the job of captain I've probably changed over the years I don't know for, for me it was like a there's five people on a, a committee and yeah you just you pretty much like a job interview Is really it? yeah it has Some, evolved a lot well, Ken, Ken and Schofield. And it'll evolve again after you, I'd say, Luke. Ken Schofield came to Mark James and I said, you two are the next two captains. Is that what happened? Take your pick. Really? And I just won the French Open in 98. And I said to Jesse, I, I think I can actually make the team. So he took Brookline. So good move, and Sam. Well done. Give him the well. away one. That, that was that was the <laughs> so first move. First tick in the box as a captain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, captain at home. All three of us have done it at home. It's a hell of a lot easier than doing it away. So <laughs> is it? I don't know. More, I don't <laughs> know. I wouldn't have thought it's more so. enjoyable, probably. I found it easier to play away. Yeah, no, I remember you telling me that. Because well, well the crowd really annoyed you. Come on, got, explain got, what you got, mean. Got, well, the, get you up, get you up. You, say, you, you know all that. It's, it's great. It's, it's the atmosphere is wild, but when you're underdogs and they're trying to, I wouldn't say put you off, but they're you know they're a little. Bit, sometimes can be a little bit unkind, and it just makes you madder and just want to play better. And 
you know, there's less uh, uh, expectation. Yeah, exactly, that's the word I was looking for. Expectation when you're abroad, but we liked it. You know, we liked it a lot. I thought. I mean, some of the great victories were there. But I'm the, uh, I think one of the best was uh, Muirfield Village. Yeah. I mean, Jack Nicholas was the god. He designed the golf course. He was my hero. And he's the captain. And we beat them. Yeah. And we had teams there, that Faldo and Woozy, Langer and Lyle, and the first time Seve and Ollie together. And they just, we, I played the first day and never played till singles. And I didn't care. Because these three were winning three out of the four matches every day. And it was, they played golf that I have never seen the like of before. It was just magnificent. And this was, it was a changing of the guard. This is, this is us in America. You know, really giving them a high. That was our first win, wasn't it? In America? First yes. time. Yeah, 83 we lost by a point. The, then the, we won 85. Then 87 was the first time we'd beat them in America. Mm. I mean, I mean it, was, it was awesome. So can we go back to the application process? Because I'm interested in what kind of <laughs> questions are they asking you then when? And what when answers you are you giving? Yeah. <laughs> What kind of captain would you be? You know, what do you think we need to change from from whistling straights? The result. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's recreate the process then. <laughs> it wasn't so, wasn't that fun, <laughs> Luke? No. What kind of captain would you be? Uh, well, a winning captain. You know, I've I've played on uh, four teams and won every one, so I think I know a little bit of thing about winning and. Uh, <laughs> Ah, I can't. I can't even remember what I said in that thing. But uh, you yeah, obviously, I, I mentioned winning. I, I think um, you know it was uh, Hero Cup coming we, back was a big one. Too, yeah, we it? we we came um, came off our, our worst loss in a, a long time, uh, whistling straights, and, and needed. We we've always had a pretty good template of success and stuff that we've done well, but. That year we just didn't perform. Um, the players didn't really show up, um, you know. And I think we needed to, to to do some changes. So you know, for me, it was um, enacting a different qualification system. It was bringing back a um, a, a new match play event, the Hero Cup that we did. Um, you know, and some of that stuff really had an impact on on some of the picks that I made. Uh, it really did, and it was really worthwhile. And I hope it continues uh, for years, years to come because it, you know, there's we don't have many match play events, so you don't really see how these guys perform as a team and how they bond and how they connect with each other. And under those circumstances, when you're playing for a teammate, there's a little bit more pressure on the line than just playing for yourself. So, you know, you get to really see how they uh, react in those situations. And um, yeah, the, the the qualification system uh, tweaking that was important. You know, we we want our strongest players, and we want some informed players, and we don't want guys that have played really well, like in February or March, and then sort of tails off, but they've just done enough to hang on to those automatic spots. So, again, certain things like that uh, that I put my case over, and um, yeah. So for the uninitiated, there are players that are there on merit, and then you get your pick of players as well. Yep. So. <clears throat> Those players that you've had the choice to, to select, how have you got the balance right between what makes a good team and like who's going to well, win we'll a game? See, of we'll golf? see in two weeks if I get the balance yeah. right, but uh, I hope so. I think uh, we have twelve very strong guys, but I think yeah, it'd be hard to pick six rookies because again, there's some uncertainty there. You don't you don't really haven't seen them in that situation. Uh, and how they've performed. So you need some experience there, people that you know that you can count on, that you've seen them uh, perform in those high-pressure situations, that they, they've they turned up in those big moments and uh, been able to, to kind of perform at a very high level. But you, you need to have rookies as well. I mean, you need to trust that there's going to be a new generation future. of people, the future. Mm -hmm. And I was a rookie one. We were all rookies at one point, um, you know. And my first Ryder Cup, we had five rookies on my our team in 2004. And uh, we still were, were very successful. So, you know, I think it's, again, the, the way you pick those is you're looking at form, but you're also looking at, you know, how they performed over the years. So, you know, I think uh, over the last year and, you know, certainly my job... Uh, uh, maybe slightly different to some captains, but I've been playing a lot you know, this year and, and last year because I felt like it was great to be around these guys as much as possible to see how they're playing, see see them how they react when I'm playing with them. 
you know, and just 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 gauging these little things, uh, um, you know, their mannerisms, their uh, their body language, their the way they handle these kind of situations. I think you, you can tell a lot, and uh, certainly some of those uh, things went into the decisions that I made when I when I made my picks. <clears throat> so, what are the kind of mannerisms or the little ticks that you're looking for that give you that trust? You just don't want to see them very phased. You want them to see them, you know, quite, uh, you know, that that uh, that they can handle that situation. I suppose, um, you know, some some people handled it better than others, and s- some people really struggled. I think, you know, they just didn't perform at a high level because they wanted to. They felt too much pressure to perform in front of me, but. Again, you're just trying to gauge, uh, you know, some of their body language, um, just the way they they their games are, the way they play, all these little things, uh, really. And uh, you're just trying to keep a mental note of that for the last 13, 14 months. So now you've both had a couple of glasses of red wine. What did you think of his picks? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think uh, I think he was in the very luxurious position of having unbelievable choices. Yeah. I can't remember a captain being blessed with having so many choices that he couldn't get it wrong. Um, and then it goes down to your point, which is how do you blend the team? Um, you know, and and potential partnerships. I think the Hero Cup, uh, who, who did what in that, uh, past records on that golf course came into it. Um, and then you got this guy coming up on the rails called Aberg, who was... By all accounts, and there we go. Yeah, yeah. But he's I mean, never even Luke, played a major, right? Yeah, but Luke, Luke's team, Luke's backroom team, have been tracking this guy since he was an amateur. This guy is not something that just came on their radar two months ago, and they thought, "Oh, this guy looks good." Um, you know, they, they've guys, they've scoured, they have scoured every European with a passport in the last two years to get to this point. This is not by chance that. Uh, Luke has got the team that he has. There's a huge amount of work and research going on behind the team. And and that's his statistics team who are doing that. And, you know, he was flagged to you as an amateur, Luke, wasn't he? Abel, yeah, absolutely. Know, We've known about him knew. for a, a year or so. Yeah, Obviously, I, he, you know, he went through the college system just as I did. Um, you know, I, I'm very good friends still with the, the college coach that I... Uh, was under, and he 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 knows all the, all about these guys, and you know, and we've been tracking him. He's been playing professional tournaments. You know, he played in Dubai at the beginning of the year, was in the top three or four, I think, through two rounds, and you know, just as an amateur, that's that's pretty impressive. You know, even I was a really good amateur, very good college player, probably best college player for a couple of years, and you know, I played some professional events. I didn't nearly do as as well as him. So you know, his. His pedigree is very similar to a Hovland or a Ram that were in college, what he's achieved. So we we knew he was going to be good. We didn't know ex- exactly until he turned professional how, how he was going to react in, in that situation, but he took to it pretty quickly. Um, very consistent, you know, compete at a high level on the PGA Tour against the best players in the world. And then obviously in the last couple of weeks of qualification, he came over. He showed commitment uh, that he wanted to try and impress me, impress the team. I mean, the very first time I played with him in Detroit, he was nine under through 16 holes. Again, I'd like to go back to, you know, just pairing up with some of these guys and seeing how they react. He wasn't unfazed whatsoever. You know, he just took it in his stride. It looked first, very first tee shot, the very perfect line, slight draw, 320 yards down the middle. I mean, not an easy tee shot. And, uh, you know, it just, it's just, he made, he made golf look very simple, and um, you know I think uh, obviously going back to winning in Kran, I mean you know he just when when he needed to step up, he did step up, and he, he birdied four of his last five holes. You know, he, 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 immense talent and immense uh, uh, future for this kid. The the difference is, um, you know, you get talent coming out all the time, and and we see it in golf, and we understand somebody comes out, they hit the ball different, they look good. Yeah, that's great, but we've seen loads of those. And only one out of 10 of those that we see that look special kind of really come through. A wise man remember telling me years and years ago, you know, um, golf is about performing in the allocated time and uh, under pressure, under gun. So that's the points that Luke is making there. In Dubai, among professionals, he performed, playing with the Ryder Cup captain, knowing that he was potentially being thought about under pressure. He performed, coming over under Luke's um, direction to come and play in Czechoslovakia 
uh, and then play in Switzerland, knowing that he's part of the conversation, but he needs to do something to make it. That's the allocated time. And again, he performed. So not alone did he have the talent, he now performs under the pressure and the heat. Um, and, and they're two different things. And when those two blend together, um, it looks like we got something special. Very interesting. Um, talking of picking players, obviously, you didn't pick him in 2014, did you? <laughs> You're going to bring that up? <laughs> yeah, I think we should. Let's get to the bottom of this. I think we should. This should be the... the I'm blaming the, Sam. He was my vice captain. Right. So we've got the captain and the vice captain not picking the current captain uh, in 2014. I think excuse we should me, finally get won, to the bottom excuse me, of this. Who won in 2014? Do we have any boxing gloves under the, uh, under the table? I think he did the right job. Eh? <laughs> I think he did, but yes. I, I think it's, it's just very no, interesting. No, you're stirring it up. You're not <laughs> getting there, Jake, okay? You should be having the two glasses of wine and not us. Right, let's, yes, we should all be on the wine. No, but I think it's very interesting how you make these decisions, how you deliver the news, but also how the players take that news. I mean, I, I don't know, does it still sting now? The hardest or? call to make, isn't it? It is the hardest call. I had to make it it's very... It's the happiest call. I made a, 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 a few tough, the the hardest, tough, tough, tough calls, ones. especially one, but um, I mean, yeah, I was, you know, when you get that call and you're not, when you're left out, you feel a little bit, you know, lost. You're like, wow. Um, you know, and it's so disappointing, you know, two years before I was playing number one in the singles in Medina and then suddenly, you know, my form did drop. I mean, I, I understand that. And I think as a player, you realize that you have the ability to get into the automatic spots. And if if you don't, it's out of your hands and it's, that's a little bit on you as a player. You should always, you always have the ability to control your fate. And if you play well enough, you're going to be there. And I certainly, my form had dipped a little bit. I still would have backed myself to to be on that team and perform and and, um, and and contribute, but you know it was it was tough. Uh, I certainly my game. I'd, I'd lost a little bit of confidence in my game. I'd gone through a different swing coach in 2013, um, then went back to my old coach, and you know there was definitely some some things uh, prof in the in the professional world that weren't weren't going my way. So they they understood that. They were watching me. They they saw that. Um I, I still, you know, obviously still, still think hurts. I could have it still hurts. hurts. It still hurts. It does hurt because That's you know you, them, yeah. there's nothing quite like a Ryder Cup. You want to be a part of it. You you've you know uh we talk about this even, you know, we had a practice trip um in in Rome. Uh just just yesterday and um you know we we all talked about our experiences and 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 how amazing those experiences are in Ryder cups they 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 outperform every anything we do as an individual because we get to share it with those people and, that, and that's what i lost i lost that ability to be in that team and and be in that uh to share those stories so um yeah of course it uh, it was disappointing i think you've done a great job your picks because it this year it is different. There's only six spots, three from the world rankings, three from European Tour to make the team. And I mean, you can pick six players that you know are going to make it, but it's certain. And I, I think you did a fabulous job with other six. Yes, you had a difficult decision. I'm sure you're talking about Moronk. You know, he'd won at Marco Simon, but so did Heikart. He won there as well. Yeah, I mean, you, know, you just got to understand. Things, Again, yeah. I've been in this role for 13, 14 months, looking at these players, looking at stats, yeah. looking at everything, looking at um, all kinds of things. And so, yeah, obviously, there's, there's every Ryder Cup, there's always one or two guys that think they should be there and they deserve to be there. And uh, it's very disappointing. It's disappointing for me because I, I, I've been through that. Mm. I've been on those the end of those calls where you didn't make the team. So I understand it and I have certainly a lot of empathy for those guys. And I tried to show that to the guys that didn't make it, you know. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, again, part of being a leader and a captain. You certainly have to make those tough decisions at times. But as, as Sam said, I'm, I'm very happy with the, the 12 that we have. His memories of 2014 ring true with yours? I mean, it is about those tough decisions. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, it was a very tough decision, obviously, for me, Luke. You know, he was the next man in. Um, and it was a tough decision um, at the end of the day. And I remember, you know, it was the count fall I hated having to make. Um, you know, Luke's first Ryder Cup match, I was his partner. Um, in 2010 and 12 under Monty and Alazaba, where I was a vice captain, my job was assigned to look after Luke. And he played brilliant in both of those games and were number one in the singles and winning that as he started out that comeback on the Sunday to, to you know, to Medina. Um, but, you know, I had Molinari. The stats guys were telling me Molinari was the guy to pick. Uh, Francisco Molinari um, 
Um, but he was a guy that was, um, he was a guy that was, uh, I, I didn't feel he had the steel in his game that he subsequently got when he started working with Dave Allred in the next year or two and going on to become Open Champion. Um, and, you know, Lee Westwood was there on the edge as well too. And it came down to Luke and Lee. And I just felt September, Glen Eagles, big heavy golf course. Um, you know, Luke or, or um, Lee's game would more suit it to that challenge. Um, and then, you know, the big thing was Luke's form had gone off. Um, that was a big problem. I think I stand corrected on this, Luke, but if I remember, was I think your best finish from May until the qualification was 40th. So I didn't see a lot of form and I was hoping for form, anything. Um, and I know you were trying hard. You were going through your, your your swing changes at the time. And, you know, I had to make a call at the end and, and uh, I felt that Lee was um, going to be more suited to that. Now, it was a tough call to make and it was, it could have gone wrong for me because of all the modern guys, you know, Sergio, you put all our best players in the last couple of decades before Sam's era. So, you know, you, you take the great players, the Polters, and you take the Westwoods and you take the Sergios and um, Monty's and Darren and, you know, put all of those players in. You know, Luke's winning percentage is 70%, which is superior than all of those. So we had natural partnerships in the team as well too. Um, but, you know, it, it, it was a tough call, but I just didn't think there was enough form there um, to play the big heavy golf course that it was going to be. Um, and who knows? Maybe it was the wrong call. Maybe it would have won by no, more having you in. Uh, but, I you know, to, I had to drop, I had to not pick a lot of ball, which is, that was the hardest decision of, of my life. I only had two picks and Garcia was one of my picks. He was my highest ranked player. Because it was it, no world rank, it was just at the European event. He just played in America. He was number four in the world. I had to, so I had to it was one of my picks. Parnovic had won in America. Ollie was not playing well. He was, but the, no one, no one has a bigger heart than Ollie for the Ryder Cup. I mean, him and Sevi together were just extraordinary. But Ollie's he's so deep and he's so wonderful. But I had to tell him no. Uh, Parnovic had won in America. And then, of course, the tragedy of 9-11, there was a year's delay. <laughs> of course, yes. Uh, pardon me, he arrived, he couldn't hit his hat. He told me himself, I'm, I'm really playing bad. I'm really playing bad. <laughs> so just don't, don't pick me yet. Don't play me yet. I'll let you know. I'll let you know when I'm ready. And he came to me on the Friday and said, I'm ready. And I put him out Saturday. He ended up tying with Tiger in the singles. But with, with two picks, it was, it was hard. 2010, oh, I think Paul Casey was left out. I think he was world number five or six. Seven. Number seven, seven yeah. So you've all been part of winning teams and losing teams in the Ryder Cup. What would you pinpoint is the difference between winning and losing? A lot of tears. <laughs> Being in the right place at the right time. You know, people doing things. Paul making that wonderful for it. Last at the Belfry to win it for us. Uh, and it comes down to so little at the end of the week. I mean, it can be half a point. A point that can turn the whole tale. Uh, on the first tee in, uh, in America, when they were, they were giving it this, with the crowd, the crowd screaming as they're playing. And I don't think one of them hit the fair, but it's Pilter that did it. And of course, pilter has got a heart of gold. I mean, you couldn't be a better Ryder Cup player than him. But it could have come down to that one half point at the end of the week. So anything can happen, anything can change it. It can be one moment in the whole week can change it. A couple of times in the early Ryder Cups, Craig Stadler missed one like this on the 18th at, at, the, at the Belfry from there. And it turned the whole thing around. From that moment on, we just didn't look back. We were going. I mean, to see a great player like Craig Stadler miss a butt like that. But that's all like, about the golf, right? I wonder whether you, whether the three of you think a captain actually can win or lose a Ryder Cup or whether that's putting too much emphasis and pressure on that role it's all about the golf yeah it's about it's the players about and the it's golf. about the, the golf captain's and in a very strong position that's putting the people out there to play their best game it's about creating the platform as i say you're not you're not hitting the shots but you are creating the platform you're putting the pairings together and you're creating the energy you're creating the buzz you're creating the atmosphere in the team room and you're trying to create a platform that is phenomenal and exciting so the players go out and they play um to the best of their ability and I, i'm i can speak from experience and in uh, under Sam, 
Um, he talks about Parnbeck on off his game. I went off his, my game too. I was six in the money list to qualify 2001 for my first Ryder Cup. 9-11 happened. It's cancelled. I come back 12 years later, or 12 months later, and I'm, um, you know, 40th in the money list, and I'm missing more cuts than I'm making, and my form is off, but I've got to play because it's the same team in play that qualified. But when I went in, as I say, the effusiveness in that team room, the energy, the vibe, I remember, I mean, it was so so innocent in some ways, Sam, I, I remember... I remember, um, but you know, I, I I got on a high from that, and all of a sudden, I forgot about my you know my game being moderate, and, and I went out and performed really well, culminating in holding a winning putt. And I promise you, I promise you, not because he's saying it here, I'm sitting here, I would, I've said it so many times, I would not have held that putt, I wouldn't have been in that mindset to hold a putt without Sam and how he managed me. Um, and how he made fe me feel like I was the most important guy in the team, even though I was the guy he was probably worried about, one of the most about because I was miles off form. No, I and, wasn't actually. There was much worse than you. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember team room. I remember team meetings, and and this was before your time, Luke. And the team meeting it's so different now. Um, you know, everything is so clinical and team rooms and everything. But I remember the team meetings uh, in the evening times were in Sam's bedroom. Sam had a penthouse in, in, in the Belfry. So we had a situation where we were actually in the bedroom, in the bed, and guys lying on the bed, some on the floor, some on the sofa, Sam holding a meeting, and Suzanne next door drying her hair, blow drying her hair. Uh, and that was, the, that was the team meetings uh, at, in the Belfry, but it created that sense of congeniality and, and fun and all in it together. Uh, and, um, you know, that, that kind of vibe, certainly from my experience, lifted me. Yeah. And lifted me to a performance level. What year was level. that again? Pardon? What year 2002. was that? 2002. That was in 02. Right. So this is, like, you've got to find a way somehow 21 years later, actually, haven't you, in this era of social media and mobile phones and to try and f recreate that sense of togetherness. Have you, have you thought about... Oh, it's already was? happening. It's already happening. You know, we obviously, the practice trip we just did was a, was a huge thing. To, towards that, just to get everyone in the same team room, uh, start discussing all that kind of stuff. You know, we've we've had group chats together, uh, opening up uh, about all kinds of stuff. And uh, you know, I think again, for me as a captain, your role is to try and create that culture, that environment for them to succeed. You know, we just need them to to play to their ability. You know, we don't need to outperform their ability or anything. They play to their ability. They're more than good enough to win so uh, already, and handle that pressure. You've already headed out then. Is that what you're saying? That, that practice trip, you've been to the course already? We've been to the course, yeah. Right. And has that been, have, have previous captains done that? Um, it's actually the first time, I, I believe, uh, that we've done a practice trip. Um, we did it. We did it. Yeah. In Belfry. The Belfry, so I'm sure. So you went I'm out sure and, it has happened, right? Yeah. And it's yeah. about trying to what relax the players before the sort of think, full glare you know, the, of the world's media. Just get a feel of it. The, yeah, get the feel. Yeah, exactly. um, get get the twelve guys in the same room together. Get them feel comfortable. Some of the rookies getting to know the the more established superstar players that you know. Are, two, three, four in the world, you know, all that kind yeah. of stuff and just get them feeling comfortable around each other. And again, you're trying to create that energy, that vibe. So how um, did you do that, Lou? Uh, well, again, I, I don't want to go into too many specifics because that's some something that's, again, I think... Um, Secret. I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to share it to, to the no. other team because, again, I've always felt like the, the, our, our ability to come together, our unity is sort of the bedrock of a lot of the success we have. Um, you know, so keeping that individual mindset, but making them feel like they're a team, that, they're, um, uh, uh, that they have a great opportunity to do something great together, to create history, uh, to leave a legacy and to kind of, kind of pass, pass on you know, their, uh, what they do in this Ryder Cup to, to future generations. You know, and I think a lot of the guys are um, want to play Ryder Cups because they're inspired by the people that come before them as well. So it's, it's just cre it's understanding the history and recognizing that and wanting to play your role and, and try and create your own history. Nice. You know, to answer, you're just thinking again too as well too the role of the captain compared to the players and absolutely not. You know, it's, it's, it is about the players as Sam says, but also the captain makes big decisions uh, tactically that can determine the outcome. Uh, and I'm thinking of Medina in, in 2012 and how we put out the team singles, four points behind. We knew we had to get momentum. 
we knew we had to put our strength at the top and we knew we had to try to eat into that lead. The worst thing we could do was lose two of the first four matches, um, or, or sorry, two of the first five matches um, and, you know, f- fall further behind. I mean, sorry, two of the first three matches and fall and, and fall further behind. So what we do is we tactically put out the team. We put out Luke, um, who was a Chicago boy, out number one, big heart. That's the kind of guy you play number one. I think we put Poulter too, who just done his heroics on a Saturday. I think it was Rory three. I think it was then Justin four and, and, and maybe Paul Laurie, who played so well in 99 in Brookline, away from home. And we knew that he had a guy with a big heart to play in, in that role. Um, so, and, and then we won. I think we won all those five points. So now we're one point ahead. Now the guys in the bottom are in America are thinking, oh my God, I thought we were going to win this easily. We were walking the park. We, we, we've lost our lead. And Tiger Woods was the best player in the world that year, 2012. And they put him out number 12. You know, Tiger should have been number one. And they wouldn't make that mistake now. I think America have moved on a lot. They've had the task force and they've learned a lot of lessons. And I, I can't see Zach making that mistake because certainly Steve Stricker didn't. And, um, I, you know, they're the kind of things where the captain does have a role. Mm. Um, but absolutely, it's absolutely, fr- you know, Captains don't win the Ryder Cups, uh, but they can help help create that platform. So how much scenario planning are you doing then, Luke, for moments like that of if we're four down, how am I going to react if I'm two up? How, how much I mean, that... I mean, I already have a pretty a decent plan of what, what I, I expect some of the groupings to be on Friday. I think, again, that, that can change. We still have um, a couple of weeks to go. But, um, you know, the, I think for Friday, um, again... Uh, I think what what you really want to do is get all the twelve guys out on the course. You know, you want to show show faith in all of them that you're twelve strong, that you you trust in them, um, and you you kind of have a good plan in Friday. Obviously, through Friday, you you observe the players and you see how they're playing, and sometimes you have to make adjustments for Saturday because of that. So it becomes a little bit. Uh, that's when the decision making really starts hitting in. I think uh, on Friday afternoon is what I imagine. Certainly, what I experienced a little bit as a vice captain. But you know, I think that Friday, the um, you know, I have a, a, a reasonable idea of like some of the pairings that I'm already going to have. Do you still get to pick foursomes first, four ball first? Yes. Uh, yes. I'm not um, asking you to give that away. I'm not but sure be, if that's public knowledge yet. But no, yeah, but you I mean, do take whether it's foursomes yeah, first or four ball first. Always, always Excellent. Yeah. That. You know, and we get the ability to uh, set up the golf course um, in, a, in a way that, that we feel like will, will favor our players. You know, we, again, we have guys that are looking in-depthly into all the statistics. What are we good at? What are, we, are we better at driving than them? Are we, where are we weaker than them? Can we take away their advantage? Can we help with our advantage? Again, the statistics are they're small either way, but we know that like, so little important. bits here and there can, can make a big difference. So. Yeah. Um, all these little things that that, that you look at um, leading up to the matches, just, again, just to try and tip the scales in your favour a little bit. Yeah, and for a, for a few of those players, it will be their very first experience, right, of playing in this white hot heat of the Ryder Cup. You've got four rookies in your in your setup. You could all sit here and say, "Oh, yeah, yeah, the rivalry is intense," but I think better than that for people listening to this is an example of when you've been in a moment where you've really felt that rivalry. If I was to ask each of you to tell us a story or a moment that springs to mind when you really felt that Europe-USA rivalry, where does your brain take you to? It's just always there. Every single shot? Yeah, it's it's Europe against America from Friday morning to Sunday night. May the best team win. There's, there's, it doesn't really change. I think we're we're all very cognizant of the history, you know, and the, and what's gone before, and you know why that why there is that passion. There is a big rivalry, you know, from Seve and instances in the past. Oh, Seve! You know, <laughs> you know, it's just it's sport, and you you want to win, and you want to. It's just uh, it's just an amazing feeling the Ryder Cup. It doesn't you don't you don't get that feeling. Get goosebumps, uh, don't you? Just, yeah, you I just, mean, it's just unbelievable. It is unbelievable. The Fr- France, the first team in France was just as you know when they started that the clap. That was just incredible. I mean, goosebumps. So can I jump in there then, Sam, and ask how, like, how do you control the emotion to be able to go out and play effectively without it overwhelming you? Um, you stay in the moment. And don't get ahead of yourself, and don't don't even think about getting involved. 
with the crowd. Or, you know, you, you're doing a job out there. And it, it, when you watch a player win a major, you know, you, they'll get excited. We'll be excited when they're all along. Pop. There's still three holes to go, the one ahead. But in the Ryder Cup, just win the hole and just go to the next. Don't, don't matter, don't run about mad. Just stay because you want to stay like this the whole way. You don't want to be up here and then down here. You want to try and stay in that same mode the whole day without getting yourself put out of place. What about you, Paul? You nodded. I would have a slightly different view than that because I remember, Sam, um, I don't know if you remember this, in, in that meeting in your bedroom, um, when... You're not going to tell that one. <laughs> Uh, about Suzanne, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I lost my train of thought. Now. <laughs> you think of the Suzanne again, don't you? Um, I remember uh, I, it was a Tuesday or Wednesday, and at the end of the meeting, it weren't very long meetings; they were ten, fifteen minutes long. Um, and at the end of the meeting, you said, "Has anybody got anything to say before we before we wrap up here?" It was the Monday or the Tuesday. We'd only got there one of our first meetings, and Parnovic said, yeah, I've got something to say. I thought Parnovic gave some great insights. Um, um, I thought he was off his game. He, he said two very, very relevant things uh, that I took a lot out of. Um, and, and the first one was, um, he said, um, I, I just want to say to the rookies playing at home, <clears throat> there's going to be a big energy coming from the crowd. And it's up to you as a player to decide what you're going to do with that energy. You can take it and ride it like a surf and you can get engaged with the crowd or you can do as Sam says and disconnect and just play. He said, neither one is right, neither one is wrong. You as a player have to decide which, which one is best for you. And, and I remember then Darren Clark talking to me about what he used to do with look into the crowd and just smile. And just, just by the body language of smiling, it raised the decibels again more. Um, and, and, you know, I, I certainly use that during the week. You know, I remember, you know, very much engaging with the crowd when I hold a pot, feeling that I was doing it for them. Um, and I remember standing on this, you asked me about the, mo about, about the moment there, Damien, a minute ago. And I remember standing on the 16th hole in the four balls, um, in, in the four balls, um, last game on the golf course with Darren. We were one down playing um, 16. I'd hit it into about six feet and I had the six footer to go all square. The matches were level at that stage. So depending on how this match finished, it would be determined how we were going into the singles. And I remember having this put from six feet. Everybody was finished. And I had this to go all square. And that's a moment where you get scared. And that's a moment where you think, oh my God, I hope I don't miss. And I hope I don't, you know, let everybody down. And for some reason, something came into my head. If you believe in spirituality or wherever it came from, I don't know. Um, and what came into my head was, this place, remember, this is the only, only game on the course. It's 15 deep, yeah, 15, 20 deep around the green. It's going to go ballistic if I hold this. So rather than thinking, oh my God, I hope I don't miss, I felt the opposite. Now I'm playing to my, now my ego was like out of control. It's like, oh my God, if I hold this, this place is going to go nuts. Now I couldn't wait to hold a putt. I hit a great putt in the middle of the hole. Crowd went absolutely ballistic and I totally engaged with the crowd. Um, you know, and I brought that into my captaincy in 14 and I had a huge image, a lot of imagery that were important with messages I want to get to the players rather than just saying to them I wanted to portray messages through images and I had a picture of Justin Rose that I got superimposed with smoke coming out of his hands Walking and the smoke came up the back, yeah, and all the crowd behind and it was basically you have the power of 60,000 people in the palms of your hands and when you stand in that first tee and rather than thinking, oh my God, you know, get the tee in the ground. I hope I don't miss it. I hope I don't sky it or block it. Just think, when it goes quiet, this place is going to rock if I rip it down the middle of the fairway. So it's, it's like a reframing of, of the moment uh, and, and being really empowered by the moment rather than afraid of the moment. And, and you know, and then you smash it down the middle and, and the crowd just go ballistic. They want a reason to scream. Um, I, I don't mind the crowd going ballistic. It's you I don't want to go ballistic. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> well, everybody's different. You know, some people want to ride the wave and some people want to be calm, you know, like like Sam obviously was, like Langer certainly was, like Luke probably was. Uh, and then somebody like Sergio. I mean, look at Sergio. How good did Sergio put in Ryder Cups compared to majors and other events? Why? Because he was empowered. He's he was engaged. And yeah. It's, it's interesting, isn't it, getting this balance? Because, you know, you're... You're very calm and controlled and you look very relaxed at the moment. But there is also this thing of getting people in the moment, isn't there, as well? But without being so much in the moment that it kind of it impairs their golf rather than improves it. 
I mean, it's it's a high pressure situation. I think you know a lot of these golfers are used to that, but the Ryder Cup is a different level. It's again when you're playing for your teammates, there's more pressure. When you're playing for your country, um, you know all these kind of real intrinsic motivators that that that, that are real and what makes the Ryder Cup so special. But I think it always again you want to again be on the front foot. Uh, always, you know, and, and if you feel like you're on the back foot and you feel like you're doubting yourself, just reframe your mindset, as Paul says, you know, turn it into something like a challenge, you know, like, uh, bring it on, like, I've got this, you know, look at the crowd, let's make the crowd smile, you know, all that, those kind of little keys that I would certainly have used as a, a, an individual level, you know, in the high pressure situations, I certainly had to rely on those in, in Ryder Cups. And, you know, even as calm as I am on a golf course, Ryder Cups brought out some, some passion in me too. I would bite my lip and fist pump and I, I just, just nothing quite like match play you know I think it's such a, a different mindset you know I was never one of the longer players so I was always hitting into first into greens I love the ability to put pressure on people I love the ability to switch a hole turn a hole around when it looked like I was going to lose I'd chip one in they had three putt and you know that that psychology uh, of match play is really really fun for me I, I've just uh, again that's maybe why I've been quite quite good at match play over the years I, I don't know but I just love that mentality just to say the roar that he's talking about, not only does it lift the crowd around the green, every other player on the team knows that's a that European blue. roar. That's right, yeah. You can tell so the roar. It's definitely European. Or if it's a wee, oh, the Americans just hold up. <laughs> you know, so th th that's important too. That's a, a, a and reverse when you're players. playing away from home. Exactly. You want it quiet. As I've been listening to you, Luke, I'm reminded of an interview we did with Rob Baxter, the Exeter Chiefs rugby coach and he he spoke about a seminal moment in his leadership was once when somebody asked him um, what he regarded as a killer question where he said would you be happy for your child to be a member of your team and he said and once he stopped and reflected on that his initial answer was probably not and that forced him to then appraise the type of coach or leader that he wanted to be and I'm interested is the a question that you'd want your team to walk away and answer in relation to you as a leader? Hmm. It's pretty deep. Well done, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to hear? Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I want to obviously walk away from this captaincy as a, as a winning captain. That, that's the goal. Um, I want to walk away having built uh, relationships with 12 guys and that those relationships will continue forever. Um, you know, and I just, my, my, my goal over these last 13, 14 months is to, to gain their trust, that, that, that I have their best interests at heart and that they can trust me with, with all the decisions that I'm making. They're going to be tough decisions, but, you know, uh, it's all about the team. You know, that's, that's the most important thing. Like, you know, you've got to put your self-interests a little bit to one side for that week. You know, obviously, so important to uh, do the things that, you know, make you great, but, you know, enjoy these moments because... As I said, uh, when I played number one in singles at Medina, I, I never thought that that would be my last Ryder Cup as a player. So enjoy these moments. Take as much as you can. Uh, stay in the present. Um, and, uh, you know, let's, let's create history together. Love that. Right. A quick fire questions. What are the three non-negotiable behaviors as the Ryder Cup captain that you want to see or that you want to instill in the team? Um... For me, it would be consistency, um, communication, fun. When you look at Team USA, what scares you most and why? Uh, I'm scared that uh, they, they beat us pretty badly two years ago. Um, you know, they, they've certainly began, begun to understand that, you know, Becoming a, a, a close net team is is important. So, yeah, we're up against it. Uh, they're, they're a very strong team. Uh, we have a, a a big mountain to climb, and we're certainly, you know, on the floor from from two years ago. We 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 understand that. Uh, we're certainly underdogs, but uh, you know, I think we we understand that we still have a a good opportunity to to get that cut back. And just moving away from the quick fast, just for a moment. I remember when we first chatted Paul you spoke about the difference between being the hunter and the hunted mm. 
How much does what happened last time out have an impact on what happens this time with Europe being the hunter rather than the hunted? Oh, I think it's, um, you know, we're used to being the hunter. Um, um, I think the fact that we got such a hammering two years ago uh, and that we got a young team uh, that's transforming, you'd have to say. There's a there's a transformation in our team going on with four rookies this year and all very, very strong ones. Chances are they'll go on to play two and three, maybe more Ryder Cups. Um, so it's it's a it's a I think it's a very positive mindset to be the uh, to be the hunter. I think the crowd will know that. I think whether you're watching a movie or you're reading a book, uh, we're always instinctively as human beings want to cheer and have empathy with the underdog. Um, and I think that's where the crowd, our home crowd, will be. Um, I think we're um, buoyed by the fact that Lucas assembled a very strong team here. Um, that's a team that's also showed him a lot of form at the right time. Um, we got some young energy and young blood in the team that's making people excited about seeing this new, uh, and this is very much a new uh, European team room um, with, with European players. And and um, I think we're all excited. I'm, I'm speaking for Sam when I say that. We're all very excited about that the opportunity, but under no um, doubt Never whatsoever answer. how strong America are. I mean, you look at Schofle and Cantley. I talk about Luke's record being 70% and being phenomenal in the modern day and all that success that we've had. And you look at the pairings that, that have been incredibly successful for them already in Ryder Cups and in President's Cups. Um, and you think, wow, I mean, these guys are up at 80%, 85%, some yeah. even 90% win rate ratios. So they're used to winning um, and we're under no, um, no doubt whatsoever. No, how, no scar tissue. No scar tissue, absolutely. And, and you know, they don't have, um, you know, they don't know what it's like to lose. They don't know what it's like to be on, the, on a beating. And that's what we were doing year after year when we were winning, you know, they were kind of old dogs coming into the race again with a lot of baggage on their heads. But these young guys don't have. They're not alone. Are they winning Ryder Cups? They're, they're winning President's Cups easily. So they're used to winning. So we're up against it, but we're buoyed by the fact that we've assembled, um, you know, strong. a I young, think, energetic. There's a lot of energy in that team. Uh, and I think, you know, the crowd and everybody behind it will be, will be right behind and, and, and looking forward to seeing how we accept that challenge. I think their team has been weakened. Quite a lot because of the other tour. They've no Dustin Johnson. They've no DeChambeau. They've no uh, Patrick Reed. They've no Mickelson. No Taylor Gooch. No Bubba Watson. In a normal year when they're playing every event, I'd say at least three of them would have made the team. And we've got an incredibly strong team. Love it. Right, back to the quick fire questions. We're, on, we're almost <laughs> done. What will be your final message to the players on that first morning? First morning? Uh, again, I think <laughs> Paul just said it. You know, be yourself. Um, you know, let's... We're hurting from whistling straights. Let's uh, be the hunter. Um, start fast and get that early lead. Let's put pressure on the Americans early and see how they react. What one person has had the biggest impacts on the type of captain that you're going to be? I mean, to us. Say your missus quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my missus is, is uh, my wife's obviously a great support, but uh, I, I've tried to learn from all of them. You know, to be honest, I think that the most similar captain that I served under was 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 Bernard Langer. Again, I love that that detail. I love that stuff. But I've I've talked to a lot of them. I've talked to Paul a lot. I've talked to. Uh, Padre, I've talked to Thomas Bjorn, I've talked to Jose Maria. Um, you know, so I mean, it goes on and on. You just try and take little bits. I've I've learned a, a few things uh, in the last hour that we've been talking. So, you know, those things have gone in the head uh, for 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 what will happen in that team room in a couple of weeks. Very good. And this is the final question, and it is to all three of you. We'll start with you, Paul, and work around. We normally ask at the end of these conversations one golden rule to living a high performance life. But today, the question is your one golden rule to winning the Ryder Cup? The golden rule is to create an environment for players to go out unburdened and unshackled and inspired to play as good as they can play. Beat the guy that's in front of you. Guy that's standing on the first tee looking at you. Show no fear, look him in the eye, shake his hand, say good luck, then be him or them. 
Yeah, I think a clear plan and a great culture. Again, a great environment for them to succeed. Give them purpose. <laughs> We're all behind you. Good luck. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Good luck, Luke. Thanks, Damon. Thanks, Jake.